Hi, I'm Zach Meisel. I'm an associate professor of physics and astronomy at Ohio University and director of the Edwards Accelerator Lab there. And this is a brief introduction to nuclear astrophysics recorded for the 2020 Physics of Atomic Nuclei camp. So nuclear astrophysics, what, what is it? In a, in a nutshell, it's basically the study of energy generation in stars and stellar explosions. Uh, the study of the origin of the elements, how did all the chemical elements come to be in the abundances that they have in the universe. And it's also the study of extremely dense matter, because the densest matter in the universe is, is out in space. And it turns out we need nuclear astrophysics to be able to understand that, that matter. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this, this talk here is just talk a little bit about what we do in nuclear astrophysics, what are the kinds of questions that we aim to answer. So I'm a simple country nuclear astrophysicist. I like to ask and answer simple questions, as all good scientists do. And so let's just start out with a really simple question. So why is this barn here red? So you sit there and you think about it. Well, why is the barn red? I mean, it's red because if you got to paint a big surface, you're going to go with cheap paint, right? You're going to pick red because red paint's cheap. But then you might ask, well, why is why is red paint cheap? <laughs> well, it's because the pigment that goes in to make that red paint is cheap, right? So it's cheap to make paint. But why is the red pigment itself cheap? Well, that's because it's it's made of iron, and there's a lot of iron in the universe. Okay, the universe happened to make quite a bit more iron than. Here is a periodic table that I'm sure you've seen before. Each box is a chemical element. What's different about this one? is each of the boxes, the area is warped to roughly represent the abundance of this element on the surface of the Earth. And you see that some elements were made in large amounts and others were made in much smaller amounts. So for instance, you see there's a lot of iron, right? So you need iron to make the red pigment and the universe made a lot of iron. So then that, that uh, red paint is cheap and that's, that's why the barns are red. Uh, for instance, the universe um, happened to make a lot less gold. We'll, we'll talk about the different processes that make these, but you, you can see in nuclear astrophysics that these are the kinds of questions we can answer. We can actually answer, why is the barn red? Well, it's because a lot of iron was made in the universe, and now we want to know, okay, well, how was the iron made then? What makes this? So it turns out iron, as all the elements, are made in stars and stellar explosions. And quite a bit of iron is made during stellar fusion. So stars themselves are basically giant nuclear reactors. And so nuclear reactions, this is what provides the power for stars. Now it's, it's a fusion reactor and not a fission reactor, but uh, a reactor nonetheless. And it turns out this has been known for about 100 years. Um, and it, one way you can tell that this must be true is just due to the sun's age. So here are some basic facts. If you look at the amount of energy stored in a chemical bond, it's about an electron volt. If you look at the amount of energy stored by a nucleus, so how much energy do you get if you break it apart, that if you break two nuclei apart from each other, you get about a million times more energy, so 10 to the six electron volts. You can then look at how much energy is released from the sun and it's about two times 10 to the 45 electron volts every second released from the sun. And then based on the size of the sun we can, and its mass, we can estimate, okay, how many nuclei or atoms are in the sun? And it's about 10 to the 56, okay, so big numbers. So let's just estimate how long the sun could live if it were just burning chemical energy. So if the sun were just powered by chemical energy, then the age of the sun would basically be, okay, how many nuclei or, or atoms do you have? How much energy is released per atom here? And you divide that by the solar energy release. When you do that, you get you know, around 10 to the 56 atoms, as we said, times about one electron volt per atom. You divide that by the energy release of the sun, two times 10 to the 45 electron volts per second, and you cancel out the units and you see that you're just left with time and you get about 10 to the 11 seconds or so which is only around 10,000 years 
So if the sun were just burning kind of like a fire in a fire pit, if it was just releasing chemical energy, then the sun would only be able to be around for around 10,000 years. Right? And that's much too short. Even, even 100 years ago, we knew that the Earth much, must be much older than that, uh, just based on the fossil record. Uh, now, from radiometric dating, we know that it actually must be billions of, <clears throat> excuse me, billions of years old. So then let's say, okay, instead of powering this by chemical energy, where we used one electron volt per atom, what if instead we use that nuclear energy, which you remember you have about a million times more energy to be released from a nuclear reaction than from a chemical reaction. And so you instead put, you know, basically a factor of a million here and you get around 10 billion or so years, which, which is about right, right? So it turns out that the sun is only around 5 billion years old. It's gonna, it's gonna be around for another 5 billion or so. And so, that's just some simple evidence that the sun must be powered by, uh, by nuclear energy. If you wanna calculate the actual lifetime of the sun, it, it winds up being a bit more involved in this, but this is the basic idea is you know, how many nuclei do you have around? How much energy can be released per nucleus? How much energy do we see as being released? And then boom, you can calculate the, the amount of time it'll be around. So we know that stars are nuclear reactors. It's actually driving this these nuclear fusion reactions. Why why are the nuclear reactions happening at all? And we can understand this in terms of something called the binding energy. So the the binding energy is basically how much energy is just stored when you take a bunch of protons and neutrons and you combine them to make an atomic nucleus. So if you took any given nucleus, uh, you could uh, weigh the individual nucleons, the protons and neutrons, separately when they're not in the nucleus, add that mass together, and you get some amount of mass. If you combine those nucleons together, those protons and neutrons, into an atomic nucleus, and then you, you calculate a mass or you weigh the mass, you compare the mass that you get from the sum of the individual protons and neutrons to the actual mass that you get when you've combined them into atomic nucleus, and you can see that this atomic nucleus actually weighs a good bit less, around a percent less. So that mass, about a percent of that mass, you know, kind of disappears. So if you take a bunch of hydrogen, uh, 56 of these protons, uh, you convert half the neutrons roughly, and then you add them together uh, to make iron, then you you wind up losing about a percent of that mass, but you don't really lose it. Where does it go? It gets stored in internally into the binding energy. And so we can instead make this plot here. This is the amount of binding energy per nucleon, so per proton or neutron. And you can see that when you combine all those hydrogen nuclei together to make iron, you can actually store around something like eight or so MeV per individual nucleon. And so when we take our hydrogen and we make it into helium, you know, we release some amount of energy. We take that helium and we combine it to make calcium or something or carbon. We release more energy. We can ultimately combine that together. And then finally we really, we, we reach iron here. And so the universe is trying to find, it's not trying to find, the, the universe happens to find the ground state. You know, nature tends to its lowest energy state. And so, nature is going to tend to a place where there's the binding energy is maximized, right? So you're converting this mass into energy that's being stored. And so matter basically gets driven. Your sun, uh, a star like the sun, starts out as mostly hydrogen and helium, and that gets driven to be converted into iron. And at all the time, as you're converting that hydrogen and helium into iron, as you're moving up that binding energy curve, you're releasing energy. And that is what is powering the star. And so then you can see that fusion in stars, and there's also some fusion in stellar explosions, it winds up making a lot of iron. So therefore, there's a lot of iron in the universe. Therefore, uh, red pigment is plentiful and cheap. So therefore, farmers like to buy red paint, and that's why barns are red. Okay, so this is a simple question we can answer with nuclear astrophysics, which is kind of amazing. And one point that I want to make is you might say, okay, well, 
wait a second, what is this magic? How do you convert, you know, this mass into energy? And this is familiar with. It comes from Einstein. It's E equals mc squared. So there's an equivalence between mass and energy. So you can convert one into the other. And so if you take a whole bunch of individual protons and neutrons, those will be heavier than when you combine them together to make a nucleus. And that extra mass here is liberated in terms of energy, and that is what powers a star. So again, we're simple country nuclear astrophysicists. We like to ask and answer simple questions. So here's another simple question. So where did this come from? So we can look for clues on this. We read that um, it says, I am the badge of fanes in uh, a sort of Greek-like language, which isn't particularly useful. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm joking. That's not the question that we really have. We don't really care where this coin came from. It happens to be one of the own, uh, oldest coins known to humankind. It's called a stator of fanes. We don't know if fanes was a was a king or a queen or if fanes were a people. We have we have no idea. Or fanes was just some rich person. Um, in any case, there's this really old coin, the stator of fanes. And so when you take this stator of fanes and you look at the composition, we found several, and it's made from a sort of ancient alloy called electrum. And electrum is basically uh, a lot of gold and some silver. And if you go back in time to when Roman civilization was prosperous, it was a lot of gold and a little bit of silver. And then as things started to decline, it became more silver and some gold. So basically, you know, there was some, some uh, cutting down <laughs> of the quality of the material. Uh, but in any case, that these coins are made of a lot of uh, silver and, and gold, which people like because they're shiny. But the real question that I have is, okay, where did where did this gold come from? You can ask about the silver too, but you know, where, where's the gold? Is it actually made? So it's it's not made at the end of rainbows, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> so that's not where it comes from. It turns out that gold in the universe likely comes merging neutron stars so this this gold likely comes from these merging neutron stars which is uh, kind of remarkable and i'm going to tell you a little bit about this neutron star merger and try to explain how it is that we know that a lot of the gold in the universe was actually made there okay so at the beginning of this simulation each of those spheres is a thing that we call a neutron star it is the remnant of a stellar explosion it's basically the mass of the sun compressed down into the size of a city. Okay, so extremely dense. You're talking about 20 kilometers across in diameter, but weighing as much as the sun. So that's an insanely dense object. And that's what happens when a star about 10 times the mass of the sun or so, when it finally ends its lifetime, it becomes one of these, these neutron stars. Oftentimes, um, you know, at least half or maybe more of stars are born in binary pairs. So you have two stars kind of orbiting each other. And so oftentimes both of these can become neutron stars. And ultimately, these two neutron stars, as they orbit each other, will wind up releasing energy in the form of gravitational radiation. And they will slowly spiral inwards. And ultimately, they will merge. And this simulation captures the last milliseconds of the, the life of these neutron stars where they finally coalesce and merge into each other. As you can see, as they, as they get very close, the gravity is so strong there that they, they wind up warping, they um, uh, rip the neutron stars apart, the material then that was already pretty dense becomes extremely hot and is still very dense. You can see the temperature gets up into billions of degrees extremely hot and dense environment and that's the violent death of these neutron stars okay so um, we'll get back to what's happening in this hot dense environment in a moment but uh, what, what's amazing is you know how, okay how do we observe these things so this it looks cute in the simulation but what do we actually see well 
this is a good time for you to be learning about nuclear astrophysics because a lot has happened in the past few years um, with regards to these neutron stars. That's that's kind of remarkable, these merging neutron stars. Lately, observations were made of the gravitational waves emitted when these neutron stars merge. This is miraculous. You know, when I was your age, this was a dream. And then now, within the past few years, it's become a reality. And we can actually see these neutron stars merge from their gravitational wave signature and other observables that I'll mention in a moment. Let's talk about the gravitational waves for a moment. So what's shown in this plot is the frequency that these neutron stars are orbiting each other versus the time before they actually merge. What you see right now is just noise on the plot. But what's going to happen is we're going to pick out, there's going to be a green band that kind of grows in intensity. And you're going to see that that's the frequency these neutron stars are um, orbiting each other with. And then finally, as they coalesce, that will run away. So let's watch the video. So the bars and the horizontal bars indicating where time is progressing. And you can see that the signature, you can start to pick it out there, growing in intensity because the waves become stronger as the neutron stars get closer to each other. The gravitational waves become stronger, so you can pick this up easily. And then it gets very intense when they're about to merge, and they're spiraling inward quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker until finally, bam, they merge into each other. And you have this extremely hot and dense environment, and all this material is flung off from the neutron star. Just as an aside, there's some really interesting stuff that you can learn uh, right at the end of this neutron star merging, these two neutron stars merging, and we can look at that on the, ne the next slide for um, black holes. So I don't have a, a movie for the last second or so from the merging neutron stars, but I do have one. That is shown here. So again, we have the frequency that the neutron stars are orbiting each other in the vertical axis. The horizontal axis here is time, and they merge at you know around 0.9 or one second. So they'll, they'll merge over here, as you'll see in a moment. And what's broken out here is two different gravitational wave signatures. So there's not just one gravitational wave detec detector in the world. There's multiple, and part of them are are a part of this LIGO, this um, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, this LIGO observatory. So you have two different uh, gravitational wave observatories here, and we're going to look at the very end point, the last little bit of, in this case, two black holes merge. It's shown there. So you can see the frequency signature, and the kind of ringing that goes on here, and so this ringing at the very end, this is kind of the neutron stars sort of bouncing off each other, if you will. And it turns out from analyzing the pattern of this gravitational wave signature, you can learn about the masses that these objects had before they merged, and maybe even about their radii, and perhaps about the property of that ultra-dense matter. Okay, so, so that's just an interesting aside. We now have the capability to observe these neutron stars merging in gravitational waves. There are also other signatures of these mergers, and that's what makes this so amazing in the past few years, is we have this comprehensive picture of merging neutron stars that comes from combined observational evidence. So we have the gravitational wave signature. It turns out at the same time, there was simultaneously an observation of gamma rays. There was a gamma ray burst. And then also, so at that point, pretty much every major telescope in the world swiveled towards this thing. And then there have been observations in the optical wavelength. So you look at this galaxy here, and then kind of near the edge, you see that it was very bright 
when this merger happened, so coincident with the gravitational waves and the gamma ray burst signature, and then it dims over time. And then many observatories over the world, they, they saw this happen. And so you saw the brightness increase and then steadily decrease over time, over several days. And the color here is indicating the actual color of the, uh, the material itself. So it started out as kind of blue, and then as time went on, it went kind of red. And it turns out, if you do a model of this neutron star merger, this is more or less exactly what you would predict if you were making heavy elements like gold, for instance. So this is something called a kilonova. It had been predicted a handful of years before it was finally observed, but now we have basically you know, con relatively conclusive, comprehensive evidence that these merging neutron stars, neutron star mergers happen, and that they're producing heavy elements. Um, so much of, or perhaps all of the gold that you've ever seen and will ever see was made in one of these neutron star mergers. This doesn't mean it's the only site that produces it, but it's certainly one of the sites. Um, and one thing I just wanna highlight here is how international all of this research is. Nuclear astrophysics research itself is quite, quite international and it almost has to be because these are big problems we're dealing with. But this is a great example of the beauty of international collaboration. You're looking at on the globe here where these different observations happened in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see that really it was, it was all over the world. You had South America, Australia, Africa, uh, and then back again going around the world. And because of this international network, um, this group of scientists here was able to, to create this beautiful, this beautiful image that lets us know, okay, that's where gold is made. How is this stuff actually made now? You know, I kind of pulled a fast one on you. I said that this kilonova is what makes these heavy elements, but what process is actually occurring here? What's going on with the nuclei? And as I'll demonstrate here um, over the next few slides, is these elements heavier than iron, they're mostly made from neutron capture. So as you go from your hydrogen and helium to make heavier elements, nuclear fusion powers that, just the binding energy release. And if you want to get to heavier elements, what you typically need to do is add neutrons to these iron-like nuclei, and you can add more and more neutrons to make the heavy elements. So before we really talk about how these neutron capture processes make these heavy elements, we need to take a step back and take a detour here and, and quickly talk about the valley of beta stability. So what's shown here is the, uh, the nuclear chart. So the vertical axis is the number of protons in a nucleus. Horizontal axis is the number of neutrons in a nucleus. Each box is an individual isotope. These gray vertical and horizontal bands, these indicate so-called magic numbers of nucleons. And what that means is that these are sort of energetically favored, and we'll talk about why that's important in a moment. Now, what the color indicates, this is the abundance of this particular element in the universe. And you can see that um, you know only this kind of slightly diagonal line here, these are the colored boxes. Well, these are the ones that are stable. So they do not undergo radioactive decay, at least not within the lifetime of the universe. So everything else, all these white boxes, and even the ones within these gray bands here that don't have a color, these are all unstable. They will undergo radioactive decay, okay? So, you know, why do we call this a valley of beta stability? Well, we have to move kind of from the, the 2D picture over here to something three-dimensional. So first, let's do another 2D. We're going to just plot the binding energy for a nucleon but going along this valley here, so increasing in the mass number and the number of nucleons. And that's the chart that we've seen before. So you get a peak kind of in iron, and then uh, it levels off up to the lead region. Now, if you look at this, this 1D curve here now in 2D, so we're kind of combining the upper left and the lower right hand plots. Instead, you get this thing that looks kind of like a half pipe. So the, um, Vertical extent tells you something about the binding energy. So deeper is more bound. And then each box here is an individual uh, isotope. And so again, the 
in one direction going kind of into the page that's the number of protons going kind of along the page that's basically the number of neutrons and you can see that this makes kind of like a half pipe so call it the valley of beta stability maybe we should call it the half pipe of beta stability i don't know so looking at this along the valley we can view these are the stable nuclei as we're looking along the, the the bottom of the half pipe and then as you get away from the stable nuclei you either add or remove you know you add more neutrons or you remove some neutrons then you wind up getting a less bound nucleus there's less binding energy and so it kind of looks like this valley and so if you start out with a nucleus anywhere uh, on the slope of the valley you're going to wind up undergoing radioactive decay and winding up at the bottom of the valley here so just to give you a better picture in 3d this is a gif where again you have your nuclear chart and what this is showing is what the actual binding energy surface looks like so you have proton number in one direction neutron number in the other direction and then the bars grow to indicate the binding energy and we're diving down into the half pipe and the dark boxes here right these are the stable nuclei and as you can see as you move away from stability you become much less bound and so matter is going to go from if it winds up if it gets created at all on the slope of the half pipe it's going to undergo radioactive decay and you're going to wind up in the valley of beta stability here why beta stability because the dominant decay mode, as I'll show in a moment, is a beta decay to take you to um, the valley there. So when we look at our nuclear chart here, again, uh, proton number is a vertical axis, neutrons the horizontal. Each box is, a, is a, a different isotope, and the black boxes are the stable ones. The colors here on this chart indicate what kind of radioactive decay that nucleus will undergo when it's created. So for the most part, you, you either do beta minus decay, where a neutron becomes a proton, or beta plus decay, where a proton becomes a neutron, and you wind up back in the valley of beta stability. If you make these really heavy nuclei, you can do other stuff. They can split apart, um, basically due to Coulomb repulsion, the, the charge uh, repelling, that's fission, or again, because of more or less because of charge repulsion, you can spit a helium nucleus out of there, that's alpha decay. But for the most part, we have these, these beta decays taking you back to stability. Okay, so now you can see that if you um, start out on either side of the colored boxes here, you're going to wind up decaying back to, to become one of these colored boxes. Okay, so what does this have to do <laughs> with making gold and with neutron capture? Um, so nucleosynthesis can proceed through exotic nuclei you can have a process that starts out you know somewhere here off the valley of beta stability and then it'll wind up beta decaying back to make these stable nuclei that you see uh, here on earth so to imagine how this happens um, let's take a look at this abundance plot here so what we have here the vertical axis this is the abundance of a given element and we're plotting them as a function of mass number so that's the sum of the number of protons and neutrons and you see you have a lot of hydrogen and helium in the sun and then you know a good bit of iron as we've mentioned because this is these are all made by fusion here and then let's look at the pattern of these elements that are heavier than iron and see if by looking at this pattern we can learn something about how these elements were made so we're basically plotting the mass number now we're trying to line it up sort of roughly uh, with this value of beta stability here because you increase in mass number as you go along this diagonal line okay so let's imagine a process where we slowly capture neutrons so we start out with something stable in the value of beta stability we capture a neutron we wait a while and it beta decays back wait a while longer you capture a neutron it beta decays back and you can do this and proceed up that that valley there or close to it now material is going to tend to pile up at these magic numbers of neutrons you're going to pile up at this vertical line this vertical line and at that vertical line because what what magicity means is that the nuclei along this column where the gray bars are at these are sort of more bound they're more energetically favored than you might otherwise naively think 
And so it's going to be less likely to have a neutron capture on one of these isotopes. So you're still going to have some neutron captures proceed beyond there, but you're basically going to pile up at these locations. So you can kind of think of these magic numbers here as stoplights in a town. So as you're driving across town, you're going to have cars kind of pile up at the stoplights. You know, traffic is still moving through town, but there's always going to be kind of a concentration at the stoplights. So if we're driving slowly here, then we will pile up right where these gray bars meet the value of beta stability. And you can look at what's the mass number that these have, what's the sum of the number of protons and neutrons, and you'd wind up getting a peak just as you see at around strontium, around barium, and around lead. And so you know, this is a good piece of evidence, and this was an early piece of evidence, that neutron capture must make some of these heavy elements. So that explains these peaks. What about the peaks that are a little bit lower in mass number? Where do those come from? They can't be from piling up at the magic numbers on stability because, you know, there's one magic number here and then there's a big gap and another big gap. And so you, you can't explain these peaks that are closely spaced together that way. So now let's use our imaginations and say, okay, what if we had a really rapid neutron capture process? So a process that you began, again, with something nearish to stability, but you were able to capture neutrons very rapidly so that before these nuclei had a chance to beta decay, you could capture more neutrons. So you'd capture a bunch of neutrons, beta decay a bit, capture a bunch of neutrons, beta decay a bit. And you do this, and again, you would pile up at the magic numbers, just as before, but where you meet the magic number is at a very different vertical position on this chart. So remember, the vertical direction is the number of protons in the nucleus, and the horizontal is the number of neutrons. So you pile up at the same horizontal position, the same number of neutrons, but you're located at a little bit lower proton number. And so rather than piling up at barium, you'd be down at xenon. Rather than piling up at lead, you'd instead pile up somewhere around platinum. And so you have this rapid neutron capture process occurring far from the valley of beta stability on these very neutron-rich nuclei. And then when the process stops, these nuclei will beta decay back to the valley of stability, and you'll get a lot of stable xenon, a lot of stable platinum. And whatnot. And so, you know, most of the elements that are heavier than iron were made in these neutron capture processes. You have, um, for the most part, this slow neutron capture process, the S process, and this rapid neutron capture process, the R process. When I say slow and rapid, you know, what does that mean? It's with respect to a nucleus's beta decay half life, so how long it lives. So to see how these two paths on the nuclear chart, these nuclear reaction paths, slow or rapid, can be different, let's just take an example, hypothetical example. Let's pretend that we start uh, with samarium-150, this particular isotope. And let's just take case A. We're going to say, what happens if neutron capture takes 500 years to occur? Okay. So each of these boxes on the chart below the isotope's name you can see how long it lives. So samarium-150 is stable. We add a neutron that's 151, that's 90 year half-life. So half of these will decay in 90 years. Again, stable, you know, 46 hours. So you can see each box has a half-life. So let's say we start out with samarium-150 and let's just say it takes 500 years to capture a neutron. So let's just follow the path on the chart here. So, we, samarium-150 is stable, so you have all the time in the world <laughs> to capture a neutron. You'll capture that neutron and make it to samarium-151. Now, samarium-151 has a 90-year half-life. So that's around how long it'll take to beta decay. Well, that's a good bit shorter than this 500 years. So instead of capturing a neutron, this will you know, probably beta decay. Then you wind up with europium-151 lives longer than the lifetime of the universe, much longer, so it's basically stable. So you have time to capture a neutron, you can do that. You go to europium-152, 13-year half-life, so that time to beta decay is much shorter than the time to capture a neutron, so you'll probably beta decay, and, and so on. You can follow that path on the chart. Now, let's say case B. Let's say we're in a different environment. So instead of taking roughly 500 years to capture a neutron, 
let's just say it's going to take a week. Okay, so we're still going to start out with Samarium 150. So we capture that neutron. We make it to Samarium 151. The half life is about 90 years. Well, it's going to take about 90 years for this to decay. That's that's a whole lot shorter, or a whole lot longer, I mean, than the week in this hypothetical case it's going to take to capture a neutron. So since the neutron captures quicker, it's going to occur. So you capture that neutron, you make Samarium 152, which is essentially stable. So then it can it can capture a neutron as well. You have a whole bunch of time to do it. You make it to Samarium 153. Well, now you reach a half-life that's around 46 hours. That's a good bit shorter than your one week neutron capture lifetime in their hypothetical case here. And so rather than capture a neutron, you're not going to have time to do it. You're going to beta decay. And so you beta decay. You make it to Europium 153. Again, it's essentially infinitely lived, so you can capture that neutron. Europium 154 is eight years. That's a lot longer than a week, so you can have time to capture the neutron again. And same with Europium 155, you have plenty of time to capture the neutron. So you can see that whether you have a slow or a rapid neutron capture process, whether it takes a lot of time to capture a neutron or a little, you're going to follow a very different nuclear reaction path on this nuclear chart. Okay, so slow and rapid here we're talking about with respect to beta decay. Let's calculate the actual lifetime or actual time scale that it typically takes to capture a neutron in these processes. So there I gave the hypothetical, you know, 500 year versus one week. Those were arbitrary. Um, let's calculate something more realistic. So how do we calculate the time scale for slow neutron capture, the S process? Well, this part you have to just take my word for it. If you if you look at a, um, there's a few different ways to get from this. One is from looking at the abundance of elements in the universe. The other is to start from simulations of stars. Uh, either way, you'll find that there's an environment in the universe um, called an asymptotic giant branch star that you wind up getting around 10 to the 8 neutrons uh, in a box about one centimeter cubed. So your neutron density is about 10 to the 8 neutrons per centimeter cubed. And this environment happens to have a temperature um, where your neutrons all have a similar velocity that, that we can characterize as 25 kilo electron volts. So these neutrons are all going to be moving at around thermal velocity. They're all going to be moving at basically the speed that they have just because it's a hot environment. Okay, so these neutrons are confined in a cube, they're moving in random directions, and so you're going to have about a sixth of them leave a single side of the box, right? Because your cube has six sides, so, and they're randomly moving, so about one sixth they're going to leave a single side of the box. The velocity that they're going to have is given by the thermal velocity. It turns out you can relate the temperature of an environment to the speed of the um, in this case nuclei in that environment and you find that they're moving at about 10 to the 9 centimeters per second so you know around a percent of the speed of light or so it's fast it's not it's not crazy fast so that's the speed these neutrons are going to have and about you know one sixth of them are going to leave a cube face that cube face has one centimeter squared area because we have a box that's one cubic centimeter and we know the speed that they're moving, it's 10 to the 9 centimeters per second. And so that means one sixth of these neutrons are going to leave every 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So if we want to calculate our neutron flux, the amount of neutrons we have per area per time, we're going to take this neutron density and we're going to divide it by this time here. And we get that the neutron flux is around 10 to the 17 neutrons per centimeter squared per second. That's the flux that you have in this environment. So what's the probability that you're going to capture a neutron in this environment? Well, it turns out if you take, you know, a typical nucleus um, at this environment temperature, the interaction probability, we can, we can characterize it with a surface area called a cross-section, and that cross-section winds up being about 10 to the minus 25 centimeters squared. This, in essence, tells you roughly how big a nucleus is. If a neutron is coming straight at it, how big does that object look? It's pretty tiny. 
that's about how, how big it looks. And so then if we want to calculate, okay, what's the time that it takes to capture a neutron, we would multiply this neutron flux by that cross section. So more or less, how many neutrons do we have per unit time times something that's related to the probability of capturing a neutron. And when we multiply these two together and cancel the units, you get about 10 to the minus eight captures per second. So now we calculate the time it takes to capture a neutron. That would be one divided by this rate, about 10 to the eight seconds to capture a neutron. So in this environment, in this S process environment, it takes about a decade to capture a, a neutron. So for a, an individual nucleus will basically be created, it will be sitting there, and sometime within about 10 years or so, it'll finally capture another neutron. So that is pretty slow. <laughs> that is why this is called the slow neutron capture process or the S process. Let's instead consider the environment that the rapid neutron capture process occurs. Here, for instance, if you look at these merging neutron stars, you have a much higher neutron density. So rather than 10 to the eight, you're at 10 to the 20. The temperature is a little bit higher, so the velocity is gonna be a little bit higher. Um, and you can calculate then what is your flux, and it's a much, much higher neutron flux. You're not at 10 to the 17, you're at 10 to the 29. The cross section winds up being a little bit lower. Um, so, th so that is just something we have to take into account, but it's not all that different. Again, to calculate the neutron capture rate, you multiply this flux, how many neutrons do I have per area per given time, times the effective area of your nucleus, and you get that you have about a thousand captures per second. So what is the amount of time that it takes for an individual nucleus to capture a nucleus, or to capture a neutron rather, <laughs> and that is one over the rate. So for a given nucleus in this environment, it takes about a millisecond to capture a neutron. So that's really rapid. That's much quicker than most beta decay half-lives of nuclei. And so you can see then that the, the S process is much, much slower than the R process. It takes about 10 years to capture a neutron. Here, it only takes about a millisecond. So the S process then, you may intuit, must happen in, a, in something like a star where you have steady burning, you have a steady environment over a long time. And this R process, must happen in a really cataclysmic type explosion where you have a huge amount of neutrons that you really can only create if you do something insane like smash two neutron stars together. So if we want to see what the R process actually looks like in action, it's, it's pretty amazing. There's a lot going on. Uh, we can look at this movie here that Jonas Lippiner made. So in the main part here, we have the nuclear chart. So again, the vertical direction, this is the number of protons in a nucleus. The horizontal is the number of neutrons. Each box is an individual isotope. The, grit, uh, the black open boxes here, these are the stable nuclei. This is the valley of beta stability. The vertical and horizontal bands here, these indicate magic neutron numbers. And then the color here is gonna tell us the amount of an individual isotope we have at that point in the simulation. Now we can look at the temperature and the density versus time that was put into the simulation over here. And then also we can look at the abundance of a given um, mass number. And that's gonna go along with the movie. So if we add together the number of protons and neutrons, that gives you a mass number and you can see how much you have with the vertical direction down here. Okay, so let's actually watch the movie. So we're arbitrarily kind of starting out down in this region. And then you have this really high neutron flux. You can do neutron capture, beta decay, neutron capture, beta decay. You pile up at the magic numbers. And then finally, the environment cools off and you can beta decay back to stability. And you wind up making all these stable nuclei with this kind of abundance pattern here, where you have those peaks for um, around platinum and around barium or so. So these are these R process peaks, so that's how that's actually made. And if you want to watch this again, you can watch it to your heart's content uh, down in the YouTube video there.
Okay, so let's ask one final question. We've, we've asked, okay, why are barns red? Where did that gold coin come from? Now, what about strontium? Let's just pick another element for fun. Because we're simple people, we like to ask uh, simple questions. So if you're, uh, if you're someone who has sensitive teeth or you know someone who has sensitive teeth, then you might see that the active ingredient in uh, toothpaste for people with sensitive teeth is strontium chloride. So why is that? That's because strontium is a good substitute for calcium. So uh, it chemically is very similar because they're in the same column of the periodic table. So, okay, cool, where on earth did this strontium come from? Okay, it's, it, it wasn't made in fusion. It's a little bit heavier than iron, so it's not made in the fusion probably. It turns out that it's not a good candidate for those uh, slower rapid neutron capture processes, or at least not in early times in the universe. It just doesn't work out uh, when you actually go through the, the model calculations for it. So, so where is it made? And we don't actually know the answer yet, but we think we may know. We have one candidate, and the story is kind of amazing. So there is a special star known as Sakurai's object. And this is a object observed in the early 90s, if my memory serves me correctly, by an amateur astronomer named Yukio Sakurai. So this is a person who just enjoyed looking at the stars for fun, you know, had, had their own day job. And what uh, Yukio Sakurai noticed is this very special object, this, this object that was, um, it, it basically looked kind of like an explosion, I guess. It was like a brightening and a dimming, but taking place over a very long time scale. And so this caught the attention of professional astronomers, and they made more observations of this object, began to model it, and they believe it's in a very special phase of a star's lifetime where you have a shell of helium burning. So that's modeled here by a fellow from Minnesota. Uh, the center of the sphere here is mostly not, nothing's going on. It's just kind of hot. You have this shell of this kind of violent helium burning going on. And it turns out um, when, you, when you model this, it winds up recreating some of the observables from Sakurai's object. So you can calculate, okay, what elements are made in this environment? It turns out this, this environment creates a relatively high flux of neutrons. It's much higher than the S process neutron density, but quite a bit lower than the R process neutron density. So it's something that we call the I process, the intermediate neutron capture process. When you model this, you can calculate how much do you have of a given element, so you plot how much do you have versus that atomic number, so the number of protons in the nucleus, and you take your model calculation and you get this blue line here, okay? You then observe Sakurai's object, what are the abundances of elements you have, and remarkably, they're kind of right on top of each other. And so one of these that you observe, one of these elements is strontium. And so it's possible that the strontium in the sensitive teeth toothpaste is made in stars that are in a remarkable burning phase like this one in Sakurai's object. And we know all of this because of this enthusiastic amateur astronomer, Yukio Sakurai. So, so an aside here is you're at the pan camp because you enjoy nuclear physics, nuclear astrophysics, or you're just interested in science. A, a point here is that even if you don't want to do science as your career, it doesn't mean that you can't study science and read about science and then potentially contribute in an incredibly meaningful way like Yukio Sakurai did and maybe figure out where the strontium was made. Now I don't want to pull the wool over your eyes too much. Uh, one thing I do want to note here is that the knobs in this model calculation were tuned <laughs> so it produces all these elements because things like the neutron density for instance were tuned. Um, and the amount of time you have that neutron density. So it, it may well be the strontium is made elsewhere. Um, that's one thing we're working on in nuclear astrophysics. This is an active problem, is where is this stuff made? So what we're trying to do is performing more model calculations, more astronomical observations, more nuclear physics experiments and nuclear theory calculations to basically try to limit, you know, 
the phase space that we have for these knobs. So how we can turn the knobs in the model, we're trying to limit how much you can turn each of those to see if we then do reproduce this abundance path. So the point that I have here is everything around you was processed in a star. I gave just three examples, iron, gold, and strontium, but everything was made in the star or stellar explosion or in some amazing process in the universe. The lightest elements, these were made at the beginning of time in the Big Bang. The elements in between there and up through iron, these were made in fusion in stars and also in some stellar explosions. Um, just for fun, you know, we call these these ones from like carbon to calcium, these are called the alpha elements because they're basically comprised of helium nuclei put together more or less. And this one here is called the iron peak, but this is all basically made in fusion. And then all the heavier stuff is for the most part made in neutron captures. And again, if you look at those peaks, you can see the R process and the S process peaks. And then, um, those peak positions correspond to these neutron magic numbers, 50 neutrons, 82 neutrons, and 126. But you put it all together and you see that all of this was made in some uh, process, explosive or stable burning in the universe. We can look at this a little bit differently on the periodic table. This is a really cool chart that Jennifer Johnson at Ohio State University made. And each box in the periodic table, the color coding tells you where we believe those elements were made. And truth be told, this is, this is sort of the state of our current knowledge. This may well change. If you looked at a plot like this um, 10, 15 years ago, then I can tell you orange boxes here for the merging neutron stars, we thought at the time those were made in exploding massive stars. <laughs> we now know that's less likely. It's much more likely they're made in merging neutron stars. So this is the current picture, you know, all of this stuff was made in a star or stellar explosion, and it's really your job as future nuclear astrophysicists to refine this chart and help us confirm that this is all actually correct. So, you know, everything around you was processed in a star. Regular stars made about half of the stuff, so the stars finished their burning, they expelled a cloud of gas, and that went out into the universe, Around the other half of the material, you know, ballpark was released in a stellar explosion or merging stars, merging neutron stars, and that released gas out into the universe. These gas clouds coalesced. Uh, one gas cloud in particular formed our solar system, and ultimately some of that gas coalesced to form the Earth and even you. So everything around you, anything you can look at in the room around you, that was processed in a star or stellar explosion at one point, which is kind of remarkable. So let me just conclude by talking about what nuclear astrophysicists actually do. So I've talked a little bit about where these elements come from, but how do we know all this? What, what kind of work is done by a nuclear astrophysicist? So it, it takes a diverse team of people to make this happen. So we need work in nuclear physics experiments, nuclear theory, astrophysics theory, and astronomical observations. And all of these teams work together to create the field that we know of as nuclear astrophysics. So in nuclear physics experiments, what do we do? We measure the properties of nuclei. So we go out and measure how much do they weigh? How long do they live? What's their probability of interacting with each other and with neutrons and protons? How were they put together? Which tells you a little bit about these reaction probabilities and these lifetimes. And when you split them apart, what do they make? because fission can happen in uh, astrophysical environments as well. Theorists, where do they come in? Well, they calculate the properties of nuclei. So it turns out we can't measure most of the properties of most nuclei, <laughs> and we won't be able to for a long time. Um, some of you are going to have to do that at next generation nuclear physics facilities when I'm retired. Um, uh, hopefully enjoying my time on the beach or something. So until we can do those measurements, we need people to calculate the properties of nuclei. And, and truth be told, some nuclear properties we may never measure. So we're always going to need nuclear theory to calculate these properties of nuclei. We need to put the ingredients together, the astrophysics ingredients and the nuclear ingredients into a model of the stars and stellar explosions. So we can model, okay, what do these environments actually make? How many, 
how many of a particular element did they make? And so what astrophysics theory does is this goes into simulating these astrophysical environments. So simulating the different burning processes that can happen in stars, stellar explosions, um, explosions on the surfaces of stars, or two massive uh, neutron stars emerging together. The astrophysics theorists are the one that make all these neat movies and pictures. They put the ingredients together to calculate, okay, what is it that we actually made? Finally, we need to validate this whole thing. <laughs> okay, so we can get our nuclear ingredients, we can put them together with the astrophysics ingredients, put them into a model calculation, but at some point we have to confront this with reality. And that is where the astronomical observers uh, come in. They observe astrophysical environments and tell us how the universe actually is. So they can go out and observe how many, how much do we have of particular elements in the sun or in a cloud of gas produced by a stellar explosion. How much light is produced as a function of time after a stellar explosion. And all of these things are then compared to your astrophysics model calculations. And ultimately that's how we learn stuff about the universe. And then we can iterate. We might find that the agreement between the calculation and the observation isn't very good. Well, then we need to go back and improve the uh, astrophysics parameters. Or we might do the calculation and say, gosh, the nuclear physics uncertainties are just too great. We cannot do a reliable comparison between the calculation and the observation. And that's often the case. And so then we identify what are the experiments that we need to do, and we, we go out and do them. And that is how all of this really fits together in nuclear astrophysics. So to summarize, what I want to drive home here is nuclear astrophysics. It's the study of the origin of the elements, extremely dense matter, cosmic nuclear energy generation, and it requires work from experimentalists, theorists, and observers to come together to learn about how all these elements in the universe were made so we can tell these neat stories that hopefully you enjoyed that I told you about today. I just want to rip a line from Carl Sagan that I think is very good and adapted a little bit. And just to remind you that you know you are star stuff. Thanks for, for listening. <laughs>